Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exclusive interview uh, on Breaking the Lines. I am Zach Lowy, the co-creator of Breaking Lines, and uh, today we've got another great interview for you. We've had a lot of amazing interviews so far the past few months uh, with likes of Louis Saha um, and Fernando Forestieri. If you haven't yet, definitely make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we've got a lot more exclusive content coming there. Uh, today, I am really excited to speak with Antonio Cholak, who joins us from Thessaloniki, Greece. How are you today, Antonio? I'm really fine. Uh, finished the training and now back at home and uh, feeling really good. Awesome, awesome. That's fantastic to hear. Um, so, Antonio, you were born and raised in Germany, but just a few months before you were born, your parents immigrated uh, from Croatia to avoid the war. What, what has it been like to kind of have this uh, mixed identity of being Greek as well as uh, being, or, sorry, of being German and, and Croatian? Um, and, and I'm curious, how did you keep in touch with your Croatian identity, you know, while, while living in Germany for, uh, what was it, 18 years? Yeah, to be honest, um... My whole family is from Croatia, and uh, as you said, uh, the war was in uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, I mean, I was in the stomach of my mother. I didn't even, uh, yeah, get the experience uh, how it was. So um, we came to Germany. I was born there, and uh, yeah, I was in a Croatian family, and I just, uh, yeah, were in touch with the Croatian roots, mentality, and everything, but. By going to kindergarten, to school, and everything, you you learn how the German thing, like how they are working, how they are disciplined, and uh, yeah, and that uh, yeah affects a lot of uh, me, like on my life, like to have the Croatian fire and the German mentality somehow, and uh, yeah, it it fits me really well. Croatian fire and the German mentality—that's that's a really interesting way to put it. Um. You know, there's so many Croatian players who were born outside of Croatia. Uh, I think Ivan Rakitic was born in Germany, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and a, a lot of others who were raised outside the country. And yet, you know, obviously reaching the World Cup final in 2018 and going on to uh, achieve a lot of success. What do you think have been the secrets of Croatia's success uh, to have, you know, such a a, a uh, aesthetically pleasing style of play and, and so many great players despite uh, so many players growing up in in different parts of Europe to be honest um, yeah it's really a small miracle because uh, there are like four million people living in Croatia and almost in every sport uh, they are successful it doesn't matter is it football is it uh, handball or yeah in almost almost every sport they are really big uh, sportsmen and sportswomen of course and um, yeah i think like the mentality you you grow like also me as a person i grow to to learn somehow every sport we are good in everything somehow and we get the mentality to like with nothing to achieve a lot and um this you learn from young ages and uh, this we continue to have uh, the belief and as I said, the fire and uh, this uh, yeah, affects a lot of uh, the mentality then in the tournaments, like with the Croatian national team, we, we always achieve great success. And um, yeah, as I said, in every sport, it's like that. And I think this is a little bit the key to the success that uh, we as a small country, uh, we don't think small, we think uh, really big. So I take it you speak three languages, English, German, and Croatian? Uh, to be honest, yeah, I uh, learned in school uh, Spanish um, for eight years. Uh, then how I like uh, move with the clubs. I learned also Polish uh, as well, Portuguese. So I learned a couple of languages. Now I learn Greece, uh, Greek and um, there are now like uh, six, seven languages I can speak really good. So uh, yeah, I'm really proud of that. And yeah, it's a small, it's a talent. Wow, very, muy impresionante. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very incredible. Um, despite spending your entire childhood 
in Germany. You chose to play for Croatia's youth teams. What was the reasoning behind this decision? Uh, and how did you feel in August 2020 when you finally received a call to play for the Croatian national team? Yeah, somehow it was never like a tough decision to make. As I always felt like a Croatian and I always wanted to play for the Croatian national team. And um, yeah, I don't know, from my family, from my roots, this is uh, what is in my heart and what I feel. And um, of course, uh, I, I'm thankful also for Germany to giving like this, all the education they gave to me and uh, what I learned. But um, yeah, to play for Croatia, it was incredible as well as I get when I get the first call and the uh, first uh, yeah, um, time I, I can uh, turn, um, how do you say, I put on the shirt of Croatia. It's, yeah, it's goosebumps and uh, I don't know how, how to describe it. It's uh, one of the big dreams you have as a football player. And um, yeah, this was a, a big, big step in my career and uh, unforgettable moment. You played for a lot of different clubs in Germany growing up, uh, such as Stuttgart, Kickers and Hoppenheim. What was it like uh, growing up in Germany and bouncing around from so many different clubs? You know, you mentioned how you're thankful to Germany for, for giving you that structure. Uh, what, what was your experience like uh, in, in so many different academies? Yeah, to be honest, you always try to search your way to way to success. And um, in Germany, you have a lot of academies, you have a lot of uh, talents and so many players, the millions of millions of football players who try to, to reach this step into the professional football and um, as well as I wanted to be. And sometimes, you know how it is with some coaches, they maybe don't give you the chance. Maybe with some club it fits, with some club it doesn't fit. And um, I tried always to find the best thing for me to where I was the happiest. And uh, this was also the clue to, yeah, that I changed some clubs, some academies. And um, but uh, yeah, at the end, it was always a good choice what I did. Uh, I become a professional football player. Um, I live my dreams. And yeah. In Germany, you know, it's tough. You have so many good players. Everybody wants to be a professional and uh, it's like a head, head on head race. Are you the one who is achieving it? It's not only the skills you have, it's um, what you have in your mind, uh, your physical and psychical uh, skills. And yeah, and uh, as I said, a little bit of luck. But um, yeah, it's really tough to reach this big step to professional football. Were there any uh, times in your childhood where, where you felt uh, you felt that there was a chance of you giving up on your dreams of becoming a professional footballer? To be honest, never. Somehow this um, dream and uh, this target always kept me like on a real high motivation and uh, I was training, working hard like every day. It doesn't matter. Was it in small age to just take the ball out and play with your friends? Or then, uh, yeah, when you see it's becoming yeah, more professional, when you have uh, individual sessions with yeah, my older brother, with friends, or doesn't matter who. And um, somehow I never uh, thought to give up. It was only one way. And this was yeah, the way straight to my dream. Uh, you ended up joining FC Nuremberg. But after struggling for opportunities in that team, you ended up joining uh, Lechia Gdansk on loan in 2014. You scored 10 goals and 31 appearances. Uh, how would you compare the German and Polish leagues? Um, and also, you know, after spending your entire life uh, in Germany up to that point, what was it like to live in, in Poland for a year? Yeah, it was... Um... It really, I would say also fast decision. It was something like overnight. Um, I get the feeling of Nuremberg or they got me uh, the feeling like I will not get a chance. And for me as a young player, it was my first professional year. I wanted to play. I wanted to show my qualities. And uh, because I knew I can 
reach something big with that. But when you're sitting on the bench or on the stands, then uh, nobody can see you. And then uh, I got this opportunity to play in Poland. And uh, yeah, it was my first professional year. I played yeah over 30 games, scored 10 goals. I think it uh, couldn't almost be better for me. And uh, the yeah, the experience to go in a foreign country to learn a new language, a new culture, it was really, really nice to be honest uh, because all, everybody welcomes you really open-hearted but um, it's also not easy for a young player if you have tough times if you're alone and uh, have to go through these situations but um, all in all uh, it uh, yeah I become a better person uh, over this year. Did you think I'm curious with regards to the countries uh, what would you say are the biggest differences as as countries between Germany and Poland? I mean, Germany, you know, it's really well structured. Uh, I don't know, it's a really like could be an idol for a lot of countries, but it's not like that. There are so big differences. So, uh, to for example, Poland now or uh, different countries, because um, I think, of course. The way of thinking, the mentality is mostly the uh, differences uh, between all these people and countries. But um, I think almost all the countries I lived at, um, they were well structured. You made your Bundesliga debut on October 19, 2013. But it wasn't until three years later that you scored your first goal in the German top flight, uh, scoring a brace against the Werder Bremen. Talk to me a little bit about that moment. Uh, you know, after playing in the second tier for a few years and going out on loan, did you feel like there was uh, unfinished business for you to score in the Bundesliga? Yes, um, to be honest, um, I wanted to score in every league I played and as well uh, in this time also in the Bundesliga. Um, this uh, day was full stadium. I, we played against Werder Bremen with players like Nabri, you know, and a lot of good players there in the squad. And uh, you play against the best players. And um, when I first scored with the uh, penalty after, it was uh, yeah, a top goal, uh, like Van Basten, they said in this time. Um, it, yeah, I'm still getting goosebumps when I think about my goals because I almost remember every goal I score in my career. And um, yeah, it's my passion to score and like to play in Bundesliga and to finish or like to get the feeling and uh, to always make you this task to score almost in every game or try to play as good as possible. It's always like, yeah, what I want to achieve and what I put in my mind. And of course, this was also something I wanted yeah, to do. And going back to your time in the second division, uh, that, you know, the German second division, obviously a very unique league, uh, which has, has been uh, referred to by many as, as one of the most entertaining leagues in all of Europe when you look at the sheer competition. Uh, how did your time there in the second tier help your development as a player? Yeah, it, to be honest, somehow I felt... Um, that the first Bundesliga is easier to play somehow than the second. The second is really tough. Um, a lot of duels, long balls. Um, you don't play that much like uh, or the spaces you have in, like in the first Bundesliga. And uh, yeah, somehow the thing I learned is that I like more to play first Bundesliga, <laughs> not second. So um, yeah. But of course, it makes it, it made me more strong, more, more like yeah, robust, rustical to, to play in a different uh, style, in a different way. And um, yeah, but yeah, I, I don't like it too much, to be honest. That's fascinating. And, you know, what would you say are some of the key differences? Do you think that the Bundesliga, perhaps there's more space or, uh, you know, it's less physical? What would you say are the biggest differences between the two? No, it's not. But um, somehow... Um, Almost all the teams try to play um, then uh, in, in this way or in fact of that, uh, you will get more spaces, you can uh, play more and uh, I think that's the thing. It's not um, 
less um, intense or something else is more intense of course because you have to think faster play faster you have to yeah react faster and everything so um, I think it's just the fact that everybody tries to play the best football tries to play and um, this is what I like I'm curious uh, were you always a striker growing up or did you ever play in any other uh, positions no, always striker, always a number nine. Um, what what would you describe your playing style like as a striker? You know, are there any players that you would compare yourself to? And, you know, are there any players who you modeled yourself on, who you'd watch their videos uh, growing up? Um, of course, there was, you know, Mario Manchukic um, in the Croatian national team, who I often looked up to because um, he was a real hard worker, scored a lot of goals, uh, win a lot of titles. Uh, my brother always told me, hey, you look a little bit like Olivier Giroud. <laughs> and uh, I, I like also his style of uh, playing. And um, when I was with the Croatian national team, I even changed uh, my shirt with him. So uh, I have good memories with that. And I think, uh, yeah, I like to watch the typical number nine players. Luis Suarez, um, they're yeah incredible players, and yeah I like to learn from everybody. Um, to be honest, yeah, Manzukic, Giroud, some very interesting uh, strikers you mentioned. You know, with regards to Manzukic, he's the second top scorer in the history of the Vatreni. Uh, he retired from professional football last year and. Uh, really has has left a, a vacancy in that center forward position. Obviously, a lot of uh, tough competition from the likes of uh, Bruno Petkovic, Andres Karamaric. But how big of a motivation is that for you? Uh, you know, filling the void left by Mandzukic and becoming the starting center forward for Croatia. Yeah, it's a big thing because uh, when you see also the history with uh, before Manchukic, yeah, there was Davos Shukar and always like to be the number nine in the national team uh, means a lot, not only for myself, also for all the people in the country. And it's somehow you lead also, um, yeah, the attack of the whole creations. And um, it's, of course... Uh, Big names. Um, I'm on my way to becoming a big name in the national team, and I try and hope to fulfill this uh, position. And um, yeah, I think uh, I can, and or I see I see myself in that. So um, we'll see. I hope with more chance, with more minutes, I can uh, also then score my first goal for the national team, and then we will see what will happen, maybe in Qatar or in the upcoming future. Uh, after suffering relegation with Darmstadt, you were loaned out again to Ingolstadt, where you made just six league appearances before joining uh, Croatian side Rijeka on loan in January 2018. What was it like to go to Croatia, the homeland of your, uh, of your parents, and play there professionally for one of the biggest clubs in the entire nation? Yeah, it... Um was a big step for me because um, I knew from the interest for a longer time and they were really successful with winning the championship with uh, also winning the cup like the double in one year and they wanted to bring me to going into the Champions League group stage for the first time in the history but unfortunately we couldn't make the deal before then I went half, uh, six months after that to Rijeka and yeah it I would say I adapted faster than I went when I was in Poland because, of course, it's my mother language. I know the mentality, but still it was somehow I was the German there. Like uh, I come <laughs> to my home country and they also called me like that a little bit. And um, yeah, to play for this team, it was um, no difficulties. It's one of my yeah most successful uh, period in my career. And I really like to look back uh, to the same. Just a few months after joining Rijeka, obviously Croatia uh, going on an incredible run 
and reaching the World Cup final. Ironically, probably the biggest disappointment of that entire tournament was Germany, who finished uh, bottom of their group. Um, talk to me a little bit about, about your experience watching that World Cup. Obviously, uh, such a memorable experience in, in, in watching the events in Russia. Uh, you know, as somebody who, who was cheering for Croatia, what, what, was your, uh, what was your viewing experience like during that month? Yeah, it was crazy. It was, um, yeah, I was in Croatia in this time. Uh, we watched almost every game in public viewing. In the final, I was with my girlfriend, with her family on the public viewing in Zagreb. It was like full house. It was incredible. The whole, it was like the whole nation was in Zagreb. And uh, it was like you felt the emotions in the whole city, the you know, for euphory, I would say, I don't know <laughs> the right word in English right now. Yeah. And um, it was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. It's like nobody could beat us. Of course, in the final was France, a uh, tough opponent, but um, we reached, yeah, we made history in this time. And somehow all the people in Croatia had the feeling that they were a part of it. And uh, this made everybody proud in the, in the, in Croatia. What was it like, you know, after the final, finally losing uh, to France in the final? Was there uh, more heartbreak than, than anything? Or was there kind of a mix of, was a bit bittersweet, you know, a bit of heartbreak, but also appreciation for how, how far you guys had gone? Yes, I think uh, it was, of course, uh, you were disappointed that you lost the final, but still everybody was... Uh, Parting and uh, the second place because it was something they never reached before and uh, everybody was uh, really, really proud. You scored uh, six goals and six assists in your first three months at Verizeka. Following year, you scored 19 goals and four assists in 30 appearances. What do you feel were the biggest reasons uh, for your success at Verizeka? Yeah, I would say only the trust and uh, the time I got there, like um, in Rijeka, they knew about my skills, about my qualities, and they gave me just the uh, minutes, the time. You maybe don't get so much in the, the Bundesliga, for example, because there you get maybe one chance, maybe not even one, and you have to take the, uh, the chance. And there I, yeah took a, or had a lot of possibilities, but I always take um, yeah, everything out of it. And I scored a lot of goals and achieved yeah, big, big success with Rijeka. And I think this was the key. Very impressive uh, spell at Rijeka. I apologize to any Rijeka fans for mispronouncing your club's name. <laughs> um, but you know, after living in Germany and Poland, how, how would you say that Croatia compares and, and what did you like the most about living there? What do you feel was the most unique aspect of it all? I would say the most unique aspect was that um, somehow you felt like you have holiday every day. Like uh, you live at the sea, you enjoy your life. Um, coming home in the summer, going to the sea or having a pool, for example, and uh, yeah just enjoying the best life and as a football player and um, yeah it was uh, really a different type of life it was first time that I lived at the sea and yeah in Germany it's a really fast life you don't take so much time to take a coffee and there somehow you t drink one espresso like three hours you know uh, it's a different mentality and a different way of living and thinking and uh, but to be honest with time i learned and uh, make the experience that uh, the mix makes it really well so i like to be disciplined to work hard to also living a fast life but still sometimes i have to say um, also with my girlfriend come on we sit down we drink a coffee and enjoy the time does seem like a very uh, beautiful country. As somebody who has never been to Croatia or Greece, I have heard from a lot of people that, that Croatia is almost like a cheaper Greece. Uh, what, I, I'm curious, what do you feel are the biggest similarities and differences between uh, Greece and Croatia? 
I mean, um, as a Croatian, I would say the the beaches and uh, the sea is uh, more beautiful. <laughs> um, but as you said, um, I think also in Croatia it's, it's more uh, cheaper than in Greece and um, yeah but still in both countries you can have a really beautiful holiday um, in Greece I mean you have so many nice islands um, it doesn't matter is it Croatia or Greece you as I said you have holiday every day almost uh, enjoying the time so I think you can't make a mistake even if you go to Croatia or to Greece so you'll always have a top uh, vacation your fantastic form uh, in Rijeka earned you a move to Greek giants Pauk, where you scored one goal in uh, 10 uh, league appearances in your first season. However, you failed to make an appearance from January to March and ended up going to Malmo uh, in Sweden. What, what was your experience like in your first few months in uh, Greece? What, what did you think were the biggest things that you struggled with what were some things that, I don't know, perhaps you didn't expect? Yeah, it was, um, it went everything so fast. I came to Greece, uh, signed a four-year deal. And um, the coach who brought me here, um, he went after like one month, one and a half to Palmeiras. It was Abel Ferreira. And then uh, we got the new coach, uh, Pablo Garcia, who is who's the coach from the B team. And yeah, somehow it new coach, new chances, new luck, and uh, he didn't see me so so much in his plans, and uh, I didn't play anymore. And this was uh, really a tough period for me because I came into a new place in a new club, and I didn't have even the chance to show my quality. And then I was already like on the bench or in, on the stands. And um, when this happened, I I had I said like after four, five, six months. I have to look for another opportunity because I want to play. I'm only happy when I can play and score goals. And then I got the possibility to go to Malmö. And uh, yeah, what I achieved in Malmö, it was yeah, one of the biggest things so far. Abel Ferreira obviously going on to win uh, the Copa Libertadores twice in 2021 with Palmeiras. Uh, I know you only spent a few weeks with Abel, but... Uh, what what did you make of him as a coach? Yeah, he was a really perfectionist, like a coach, a uh, really relaxed guy and really positive-minded guy. But um, he have his idea, and like he, he plays. I watched some games from Palmeiras, and uh, yeah, there are some uh, similar things what uh, he also tried to do in in Pauk and. Um, yeah, for him, it was a big move, of course. Uh, it means a lot if a club like Palmeiras wants you. And um, yeah, he's uh, really in tactical things and like as a person and in everything, it's a really complete coach, to be honest. You ended up joining Malmo on loan in March 2021 and finished as their top scorer with 15 goals. Uh, you know, after struggling for opportunities under Pablo Garcia, did you feel like you had kind of a, an onus on your back uh, to, to prove the people wrong and show just what you can do as a player? Yes, uh, it was like this. And somehow I didn't get the, the chance to show my uh, uh, quality and show what I really got. And um, yeah, but you can't do anything against. So it's it was really, as I said, a tough period. But um, I always believed in myself for every day as hard as I can and to wait for the moment and to wait for the chance when I have the chance to show it. We've gone through the transition from Germany to Poland already. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the difference, about the transition from Greece to Sweden. Uh, what, what did you make of the differences between the two countries, not just in terms of football, uh, but also culturally? I mean, for me, it, was, it wasn't that... Uh, big uh, differences because I lived in Croatia, I lived in Germany and it was like uh, when I went from Greece to Sweden like I was uh, moving to Germany. It was, it's a really similar way of life. Uh, I would say maybe the people are a little bit slower than in Germany but still it's almost uh, yeah, 
the same structure, the same organization in 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 the country, and um, yeah. So in that case, I didn't have any problems to adapt as fast as possible. And this season, you led Malmo to the Champions League group stage by scoring five goals in the qualifiers uh, before starting for them against likes of Juventus, Chelsea, and Zenit. What was it like for you to, you know, play against these teams, hear the Champions League anthem blasted on the speakers, and uh, start for your club in the biggest club competition in Europe? Yeah, um... It was crazy, especially the way we went through. We started with the first um, round in qualification, um, going the whole way to the group stage, um, hearing the anthem uh, of the Champions League on the pitch, having like, yeah, the shirt of the Champions League. It was uh, incredible. And then to play against, yeah, as you said, Juventus, Chelsea and Zenit, was uh, yeah experience I will never forget of course but it uh, makes you yeah hungry for more and um, yeah it was uh, a thing that I wanted to achieve all, all my life and it's a thing like you I had like as a wake up call the anthem of the Champions League you know when I was younger and this is like something you always dream of and that's why um, I was really, really happy. It still makes me goosebumps when I think about that. But it's like yeah, the, one of the biggest things you can achieve in football. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I didn't watch every single one of Malmo's Champions League matches, but I do remember watching uh, the game against Chelsea that they played in Sweden. And I remember just uh, it almost seemed like the Malmo crowd was like the 12th player on the pitch because they were so loud, so... Uh, ferocious. I'm curious, what do you think have been the biggest, what are, what are some key differences in the fan culture between, uh, you know, Greece, Sweden, Germany, and Poland? Um, yeah, to be honest, all these four countries are really different types of uh, fan cultures. In the Bundesliga also, you, it's like almost every game uh, sold out. Um, you have every club have his ultra groups I mean like everywhere I played but you have um, yeah I would say in Greece they're really like hardcore positive um, crazy minded uh, fans and uh, they're living for the club and uh, it was it's like crazy in every coffee you go the or everywhere you go, they just speak about pauk, pauk, pauk. And um, it's crazy what vibrations and feelings you get if just you're moving or walking in the city. And yeah, and in Sweden, it's, uh, I would say, more calm in the city, but in the stadium, the people is going crazy. So it's um, really different kind of cultures, uh, fan cultures, but um, everywhere the stadium, stadiums are burning. So um, I think... All in all, all the people having the same uh, yeah, emotions and, and feelings in the stadiums. You played against Juventus, Chelsea, and Zenit in the group stage. You know, three clubs with a lot of history in this competition. Who, I'm curious, who has, the, who has been the toughest center back you've ever played against? I think it was Bonucci, to be honest. Um, he was really experienced, really tough. And also in the first game I played against him, I don't know if I um, yeah, catch any ball. So um, he was the toughest one I played ever against. Uh, you turned 28 in September. What would you say have been the lowest moments and the most challenging t times, time in your career? And also, what would you say has been the highlight of, of your career? To be honest, I always look for the positive things, so I don't even remember the bad things. Um, yeah, the highlights, of course, in my national team uh, debut and, uh, of course, the Champions League debut and uh, all these games. So um, I had uh, also important goals with that which I scored, for example, two goals against Glasgow Rangers um, when we achieved the next round for the Champions League qualification. And... Yeah, these are like key moments in my career. I will never forget. Absolutely. Uh, you, were, uh, you were an unused substitute in the previous match against Olympiakos. 
Um, how do you feel at the moment with your current situation at Pawak? Yeah, I mean, I now I came uh, back from my loan um, where, for example, in Malmö, they're starting the preseason now. I am coming back now in a new... Um, yeah, in a in a new season, the uh, season is just uh, playing, going on all the three days we are playing, and uh, I'm here now. I try to adapt as fast as possible because here in Pauk, it's my club, but still there are new players, new coaches now, and I have to fulfill my position and my uh, yeah, my all my 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 things I have to do, and um, for now I try yeah to to adapt as fast as possible and, of course, to score as soon as possible, as many goals as possible. <laughs> Finally, uh, you know, you, you did turn 28 in September. Uh, what do you think have been some areas that you've improved on in, in the past year or so? And what are your biggest goals uh, in 2022? Um, yeah, of course, I made a lot of experience throughout my career and um, I, I become more calm uh, before I wanted things to happen more faster, you know, like uh, like the patience was not there so much, but uh, of course I was always a hard worker and I worked for my my achievements as good as I, uh, I could. And um, when I think about 2022, there's one, uh, of course, big target. It's the um, World Cup in Qatar and uh, I hope that I can achieve this and uh, go for my first uh, big tournament with the national team. Absolutely. I hope you can as well. Uh, thank you so much, Antonio. Mm -hmm. It was a real pleasure to speak with you, and I I'm wishing you all the best in 2022.